It's all it's right all to right. be just a little bit crazy. Being, being creative, creative is being a little bit crazy in just the right vibration. vibration. With, that With that in mind, you should understand, understand God's, God's completely God. insane. <laughs>
Nor does it matter how wonderful or not a person running for any office or leadership position is. As long as the general public is complicitly ignorant and wishes to remain that way, you will still have crime, poverty, corruption, war, genocide, starvation, economic ruin, environmental destruction, and all of those wonderful things that continues to head the human race down the rocky road to collective suicide through a form of mass Stockholm Syndrome. In this presentation, we will use some fun cartoons to better illustrate the points. First, we will briefly show you how the systems we have right now work, and in a simple, straightforward way so that you don't have to be a brainiac to understand it. Then we will show you how a system of anarchy actually works, and would work, if not for the fact that until the collective human race grows up a little more, we are still too immature to be able to implement it. Of course, at this stage of the game, we need to grow up quickly or the human race is forfeit. So never underestimate the power of the individual to inspire the masses. Gandhi said be the change you want to create in the world. You don't need to be the whole fire, you only need to be the spark of inspiration that gets the fire going. You are more powerful in your individuality, creativity, imagination, and capabilities than the current society wants you to be aware of. Hey, an alien! Yes, I have travelled across space to check on the progress of your species. Cool. Shall I take you to our leader? Your what? Our leader, the guy in charge. The guy in charge of what? Well, in charge of everything. You have one guy in charge of everything? No, no, he's in charge of government. What is government? Well, government makes the rules for us. It tells us what we can do and what we can't do. So is government really smart? They come up with wise rules for you to follow? Well, mostly. But some of its rules are really stupid. Do you disregard those rules? No, we have to follow the rules, even if they are stupid or we disagree with them. Government punishes anyone who disobeys the rules. So you are slaves to government? No, 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 it's not like that at all. Government works for us, the people. It serves us. We're the boss. It tells you what to do, and it punishes you with violence if you disobey it, and yet you're its boss? Yeah. But there are some things government does that you don't like. Well, yeah, not everything government does is popular. Like spending on wars, for example. What is a war? It's when government basically spends the people's money on weapons and soldiers and then sends them over to the other side of the world to kill a bunch of people over there and destroy their country. I don't like it that government does this. Well, I can see why you might not like that. Have you humans reached the stage where you generally consider stealing, enslaving and killing each other to be bad things? Oh yeah, we know that. Don't steal, don't attack, don't assault. But you give money to government and they use it to kill people. Well, yeah. But government does good things with tax money as well. Why don't you stop paying for the things you don't like and only pay for the good things it does? No, we can't do that. You can't just decide to stop paying taxes because the rules say that everyone has to pay taxes. But the rules come from government though, don't they? Yeah. 
So government made a rule which says that everyone has to pay them money. So everyone pays taxes because if they didn't, government would punish them using violence? Well, yes, but most people don't mind paying taxes. Most people feel obligated to pay taxes and obey government laws because it's for the good of society. Society needs government and that means we all have to pay taxes. So just to make sure I've got this straight, government makes the rules and you feel obligated to follow the rules, even the ones you don't like, and it tells you what to do and threatens to punish you if you don't do what it says, and it uses some of the money that it's taken from you using threats of violence to pay for things you don't like and actually think are immoral, like mass murder. Yeah, but we can ask it to please tell us to do smart things, and please don't take our money and use it to kill people. We're allowed to ask them to tell us to do what we want them to tell us to do. Are you guys just scared of this thing? Is government some huge monster that can just squish you at any moment if you disobey? No, government isn't a monster. Well, what is it then? Could you draw me a picture of it? Government isn't really the sort of thing you can draw a picture of. Maybe you could take me to it. Where is government? You mean the building? Government is a building. No, but the politicians who make up the government have buildings they work from. So government is a group of these politicians? Yeah. OK, so what species are these politicians? Well, they're... human. Like you? Yeah. So politicians are humans, and they're government. You're a human, but you're not government. No. So it's the politicians, they're the ones that boss the rest of you around, and make you do things you don't want to do and take your money using threats of violence. But even though you're all humans, you're not allowed to boss them around and take their money? No, they put us in a cage if we did that. But look, it's not like the politicians can just do whatever they want. Like, a politician can't just come up to me on the street and make me give him money. They can't do that. Politicians can only do things like that in their job when they're working for government. Oh, so politicians aren't government, they just work for government? Yeah. OK, so government isn't a monster, and it isn't a building, and it's not politicians, it's something else. And it employs politicians, who are just regular humans, who get to order everyone else around and take their money. How does a regular human become a politician? Well, that's the great thing about our government. It's a democracy. And that means that the people actually have the power. Because we get to decide who among us get to be the politicians. We get to vote. And if a politician starts doing things we don't like, we can just replace him with someone else at the next election. So the people that get chosen to be politicians only get to boss people around and take their money for a short time. And then they go back to being regular humans? Exactly. That sounds like a powerful position to be in. But if you get to choose who does that, I assume that politicians are always the wisest, most honest, caring and respected people among you. Well, no, not really. I wouldn't say politicians are known for being honest, or wise, or caring. And they're certainly not the most respected people among us. Come to think of it, most politicians are lying, power-hungry crooks. The ones you chose? Yeah, they're always doing things we don't like. They use taxpayers' money to enrich themselves and their friends, and they never keep their promises to voters. They've been caught stealing and lying and taking bribes, and they mostly do what the big corporations want. Yeah, they're always doing stuff like that. They're completely corrupt. They're a bunch of lying crooks. 
But you said that most humans know that stealing and beating each other up and killing are wrong. And you said that you have the power because you can change who's in charge. So why don't you just replace the lying, thieving, murderous, crooked politicians with some regular people? Well, we don't try to elect lying crooks. It just always turns out that way. But we have to have a government because some humans are nasty and might kill or enslave or steal. Civilization just couldn't survive without government. Let me get this straight. Because you're worried about the small number of nasty people that are willing to kill and slave and steal, you think it's necessary for your survival to have a system where some humans among you, for a short while, get to call themselves the government, and they get to order everyone else around like slaves, and, if they want, commit mass murder overseas, using money they stole using threats of violence. Politicians get to kill, enslave and steal, because if they didn't, someone else might? And you try to elect good, honest people to be politicians, but what happens every time is that the people you elect turn out to be corrupt, evil, lying crooks. That's your system. Yeah, that's pretty much government. The title of my talk today is Removing Mental Malware. Malware as in computer malware, where somebody writes a program and sticks it on your computer by way of a virus or something. It'll be the mental version of that. Step one is, do you want to know the truth? If you really want to know the truth, that requires you to put everything you believe at risk. To question everything you assume, to question everything you think you've already figured out. We believe what we're taught. We believe what we hear everyone around us telling us, what our teachers tell us, what our parents tell us, what the community around us tells us. You may have some pet theory, some conspiracy theory, or some weird theory that other people think are weird. And if you found out the truth, you might find you were actually wrong, that your theory was bogus. And if you are not open to that possibility, then you're not really going for the truth. On the other hand, there may be somebody who says, well, I believe what the mainstream believes, and I believe what everyone around me believes, and I'm not going to consider anything that sounds unusual or weird. They don't want to know the truth either. Wanting to know the truth requires risking what you already have and what you're already comfortable with, which is why most people don't want to know the truth. Assuming you actually want to know the truth, how do you get there? By using the scientific method or the scientific process. I'm a huge fan of the scientific process. I think it's the only way to reach rational conclusions. However, I'm also a huge critic of a lot of people who stick the label scientist on themselves. The scientific process, in a nutshell, is you take in evidence, you take in data, and from it you try to extrapolate an explanation of reality, or pieces of reality. You try to get a worldview that actually matches the world outside of you. And sometimes you find out, whoops, well, that data made it look like this, but now this data makes it... And so you have to test your theories and sometimes throw them out. A lot of people who wear the label scientists and pretend they like science, what they do is take in a lot of evidence, look at the stuff that already fits what they already believe, and the other stuff, that's just weird. We're, we're going to pretend that didn't happen. So by the scientific process, I don't mean come to the results that are now usually labeled under science. I mean the actual scientific process of look at the world, take in all the evidence you can, and then try to figure out reality from that. Even if the evidence is weird and disturbing and goes against what you already want. Another problem that stops people from using the scientific process is when it starts to point at a conclusion that they don't like. They will often bail out. If you start to see a rational examination of the evidence pointing towards you were totally wrong about something, most people will bail out and run the other way because they're invested in what they already believe in. Now, this is especially true if it's something you believed in your whole life, you've worked on, maybe if you've devoted your career to something and somebody comes along and says, I want you to consider this and rationally look at the evidence and find out that your entire career was based on a gigantic lie. There is a huge motivation to not look at that, to not use the scientific process. That's what each one of us has to look out for inside our own heads. 
Are there any walls we put up because we think, I don't really like where that evidence and logic is leading me, I'm just going to kind of stick a wall there and pretend I didn't see that. That's the comfortable, easy thing. There are lots of conclusions people don't want to reach. There are lots and lots of conspiracy theories, and when people say conspiracy theory, they're usually bashing it, and what they usually mean is, I don't want to consider the possibility that the explanation for this event that happened is something that's really going to creep me out. So I'm going to call it a conspiracy theory. That is not scientific and that is not rational. When you have things happen like what happened in Boston and 9-11, I don't even bother telling people what I think very often or arguing the evidence. I just go to people and say, did you look at this evidence? Did you approach this wanting to know what happened? Or did you approach this determined that this will be the conclusion you reach no matter what? And that's most people, because most people don't want to know the truth. And the only people who ever move it forward are the ones who say, yeah, I want to know the whole truth. It might be unpleasant, and it might totally mess up my view of the world, and might mess up my life and everything else, but uh, yeah, truth's got to come first. Assuming we want to know the truth, and assuming we know the scientific process, why do we come to so many different conclusions? What messes things up for us? Checking for warped perceptions. The primary problem in the world is not greed, and it is not hatred, and it is not malice. It's the fact that people's perception of reality is hugely twisted by things they're taught, by things they hear all around them, their upbringing. I think it's pretty self-evident that if you have one huge group of people who means well and wants truth and justice to prevail and sees reality as it is, and another huge group of people who wants truth and justice to prevail, and they see reality as it is, they probably wouldn't be trying to murder each other. Which means the underlying problem in every war is not the hatred, even though there's obvious surface animosity while they're trying to kill each other. It's warping of perceptions. At least one side, and I would say both sides every time, their perceptions have been warped such that they think trying to kill that other guy is necessary for humanity. And the guy over there thinks trying to kill them is necessary for humanity. And if the one side or both sides whose perceptions were mangled could fix their own perceptions, the war stops. Because they suddenly realize, okay, you think you're the good guy and I think I'm the good guy. If we both understand reality, we'll probably stop killing each other. The problem is, this is something I refer to as mental lenses, things that are inside our head that warp the way we see the world. Everybody thinks he sees the world as it is. It's impossible not to. You think you see reality, you think you have a pretty good grip on reality. There, there may be things you say, well, I don't know about this and I don't know about that, but I have a general grasp on what's going on. Nobody thinks his own perception is messed up. Now, everybody can point to all sorts of other people's things. And pointing out that somebody else is delusional doesn't make them not delusional, even if they are. The only thing that moves humanity forward is if somebody dares to look inside their own head and say, are there things that are messing up my perception of reality and making me do stupid stuff? Because the only one you can actually change is yourself. Unfortunately, most people would much rather shoot at other people than say, Maybe my belief system is based on some bogus ideas. So for the past 10,000 years or whatever, we've just been killing each other because I'd rather kill you than think about my own paradigm. Not a good situation, but it is changing with events like this. Why would our perceptions be warped? When I talk about mental malware, I mean stuff that was put there intentionally to mess you up. Most of what we believe is passed on to us from our parents, our teachers, our friends, people around us, our society as a whole, the media, all the things we're exposed to. I do not believe that everybody out there telling a lie is trying to tell a lie. I believe the vast majority are just passing on lies that they were taught because they don't know any better. When parents teach their children stupid things that they learn, they're not thinking, ha ha, I'm going to get my kids for this one. They think they're the same reality to the next generation. When teachers teach the same garbage that they were taught that's untrue and based on a bunch of false paradigms, they're not trying to be nasty, they're just passing on their own misunderstanding. And this is why, number one, is important, we have to want to know the truth. 
Because if someone who cares about you and loves you is telling you this and they sound so sure of themselves, the hardest thing in the world is to think, well, you know, maybe you're totally wrong, Mom and Dad. You know, I know you mean well. I don't think you're trying to fake me out. But I think you and everyone around me might be totally wrong about this. Uh, another reason people don't want the truth is if you're the only one who believes something, it's really uncomfortable. I suspect people in this crowd know that a lot more than the general public. Not being in the majority is an uncomfortable place to be, which tends to push us into a majority that all can feel confident that together they believe the wrong destructive things. For the purpose of this talk, what matters is getting it out of your head. Those of you who know about the, the Prussian indoctrination system and like John Taylor Gatto's work, you can very much see the openly admitted intentional design of programming people to be easily controlled and, and unthinking machines. It doesn't even matter if, if you got these warped perceptions by way of misinformed but benevolent sources or actual psychos trying to control you. Because either way, if they're stuck in, in your head and messing with your perception, then they need to be fixed. The primary example of malware that I talk about is the malware revolving around concepts of government and law and politics and authority and crime and all the terminology and all the thought processes that tentacles come out from the belief in authority. It's really easy to point to some bad guy, to point to some tyrant, to point to some regime and say, that's the problem, they're scary, they're bad, let's go do something about them. The main problem isn't the bad guys. The bad guys will keep being bad guys. The main problem is the power they get from the warping of the perceptions of their victims. And if you fix the perception of their victims, the control freaks don't have any power anymore. Everybody believes in government. They believe it's real. They believe in the law. They believe in authority. And they have all these perceptions that they think are based on reality. That is a great sign that you have somebody controlling what's in here. But if you're convinced that it's law and it's government and it's authority, literally people feel profound moral guilt at doing something that doesn't hurt anybody but disobeys the group of people who claim to be government, who claim to have the right to rule. I love the term law-abiding taxpayer because it's people proudly displaying their malware for all the world to see. I am proud that I give my money to a bunch of crooks and I do whatever they tell me. Law-abiding taxpayer. That is all it means. Lots and lots of history is good people who are taught to believe the lie of authority, either just spectating and doing nothing, or actively helping to dominate, oppress, or even kill their fellow man because authority told them to. And that's what I mean by the fact that the problem is not the psychos. There's only one reason we know the name Adolf Hitler, and it wasn't because of Adolf Hitler. It was because lots of people in Germany believed in the thing called authority. And so if the guy is in a certain position and has a certain job description, and he tells you to do something, well, you do it. You follow orders. You enforce the law. If they didn't believe that, what could one goofball with a stupid mustache possibly have done on his own? Same thing everywhere. Red China, Soviet Union, you can go anywhere you want. The mass oppression was not because all the individuals doing it thought, you know, today I just want to go hurt somebody. It's because they were raised with the malware of authoritarianism and government and law and all these concepts that go together so that they literally feel guilty about doing what they know is right. But Stanley Milgram did experiments which totally show that this applies to Americans as much as anybody else. We know what is right and wrong and we will do the wrong thing if a perceived authority tells us to. That's the horrendous punchline. And I highly suggest everybody go check out those. It should be required. People should be forced to read that book. Stanley Milgram's book is called Obedience to Authority, and it goes all through his experiments, which is really creepy, but it's an outstanding expose on mental malware and the destruction it leads to uh, making good people do really nasty, evil stuff. Even inside the freedom movement, because the malware is so lodged in most people's heads, even the vast majority of people say, I want freedom, they don't recognize their own malware. They don't even check for it. Because they think, the problem's in Washington, D.C. Those guys are bad guys. 
And yeah, they are bad guys, but they're not the problem. And we have to go do something to them. And whenever that's the focus, you lose, because you miss the underlying problem of the world. The entire idea that we have to do something to the ruling class, whether it's we have to vote in people who will speak right, we have to go petition them, we have to go have a protest, we have to have a revolution. <clears throat> there is nothing you can do to the control freaks who pretend to be government that will fix reality. As long as that malware is in their heads, it doesn't matter what you do to the current ruling class. Elections and petitions, even revolutions, they're pointless because that isn't the problem. If the problem is inside your head, shooting somebody in Washington isn't going to fix it. But if you imagine a world in which the malware is gone and tomorrow 300 million people wake up and say, I don't really feel a need to give a bunch of my money to them. In fact, I don't feel a need to use their crummy currency that keeps going down in value. I don't feel the moral obligation to obey their arbitrary stupid commands and I definitely don't want to fuel their war machine in their police state. So, man, yeah, yeah, cool. Now, if one person does that, out come the jackboots and he gets stomped and killed and thrown in a cage. If 300 million do it, we're done. The end. As long as you're focused on doing something to the rulers, nothing fixes because they're not the problem. And all of their power comes from the malware in our heads. Our perceptions that they have the right to do this, that their commands are law, that when they say, give me money, it isn't robbery, it's taxation. These ideas in the heads of the victims are the problem. But what it comes down to is when people understand the malware, it goes away. Don't be scared of chaos and anarchy. Be scared of the guy who says, put me in charge and I will fix the world. He is not your master. You are your master. To you. Makes perfect sense. Okay. Anybody else want to throw anything out at us? Sir? Uh, I think you're an anarchist and you don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> do, it, do you hear me denying anything? <laughs> Many people, when they hear the word anarchy, think of chaos and mayhem. So they assume that an anarchist must be in favor of disorder and violence. That is the complete opposite of the truth. Most objections and complaints about the anarchist or voluntarist philosophy are not actually about the philosophy itself, but result from people misunderstanding what the philosophy is all about. To illustrate a few points, we will use the example of two fictional islands. Authoritania, where there is a ruling class or government, and Anarchia, where there is no ruling class of any kind. We will use these islands to examine several common misconceptions about anarchism. Lots of people think anarchy means every man for himself, or survival of the fittest, or the absence of any social cooperation or organization. They think that anarchy means everyone has to be self-sufficient. This comes from the false assumption that some kind of government is necessary for any organization to occur. Whether it's part of a republic, a democracy, a kingdom, or a dictatorship, a ruling class issues orders called laws and punishes anyone who disobeys them. That is not cooperation. That's domination. It's one group forcing its will on another. Authoritarianism can be used to force people into organized patterns, but that does not mean that people are incapable of organizing their activities without being forced. The most productive and useful examples of organization that we see today are anarchistic in nature. No one was forced to build the grocery store you go to. No one was forced to produce or sell anything in it. Everyone involved in the vastly complex operation of growing your food, transporting it, displaying it in the store, and selling it to you, everyone involved participates voluntarily, 
working in exchange for money. You and all the other store customers choose freely which store to go to and what to spend your money on. This purely voluntary arrangement allows for an amazingly complex degree of organized cooperation without anyone being coerced to participate. In contrast, under government, a very small group of people comes up with an idea and forces everyone else to participate in it and provide for its funding with tax dollars. In the authoritarian version of a supermarket, the ruling class would tell people what to produce and how much, what prices to charge, and they would tell customers what they must buy and what they must pay. Anyone who did not comply with the centralized master plan would be punished in some way. That is how government does things. Which one of these would you prefer? Another common but incorrect assumption is that if there were no ruling class or no government, people would have no way of defending themselves against common criminals or foreign invaders. Again, this is simply not true. The government version of protection is inherently hypocritical. Governments will use their hired law enforcers to find and lock up some of the private thugs and thieves and prevent them from preying on people. But every ruling class gets the money for its operations by way of taxation, demanding money from its subjects and punishing those who don't pay up. Oddly, every ruling class insists that it needs to be able to forcibly control and extort money from people in this way in order to protect them from private criminals who might try to forcibly control and extort them. In contrast, if there is no government, people do not lose their inherent right to defend themselves from violence or to defend what they have from those who would take it. Every person has this right, and they also have the right to organize and cooperate with each other to exercise that right. Organizing for mutual defense does not require any government-granted laws or authority. No one wants to be attacked or defrauded, and everyone wants to feel safe. Whether each person takes this on himself or herself individually, or whether they hire and organize others to do it on their behalf, it can be done on a voluntary basis. Those who insist that government is necessary often claim that if there wasn't a government, then smaller private gangs would spring up to enslave and rob people. Organized crime gangs exist along with government, and most people do not understand the dynamics between them and how government enriches and empowers organized crime while appearing to fight it. Black markets enrich organized crime, and money allows them to buy government protection. There's no reason to think they would do as well in an environment of freedom where they would have fewer ways to make money and would be up against both individual and organized armed citizens. A criminal gang that's recognized as such has far less power than a gang whose aggression is perceived to be legitimate and proper. And that's the gang we call government. When thuggery is called law enforcement, and thievery is called taxation, and self-defense is called crime and terrorism, then even the widespread ownership of firearms can't do much to stop the aggression. Imagine a private gang trying to do the things that government does without the aura of authority, and imagine how a well-armed population would respond to this. The gang would fail quickly and dramatically. Another concern that people have when they first consider the idea of a stateless society is that some people are truly malicious, destructive, and sociopathic. The concern is that these people would be free to do anything they wanted and no one would stop them. But this concern is again based on a basic misunderstanding of human nature. Wherever we have a government ruling class, we still have freelance thieves and thugs who are not deterred by the laws of the politicians. In some instances, they're stopped by force by the police, or they decide not to commit a crime for fear of what the police might do to them. What makes this deterrence work 
is not the legislation or the official badges, but the simple threat of harm to the sociopath. It really makes no difference whether the threat comes from the police, or another citizen, or even another criminal. A sociopath doesn't care about laws or social rules. He cares about avoiding pain and hardship for himself. This is still true when a government ruling class is not involved at all. If the intended target of a would-be carjacker pulls out a gun, it doesn't make any difference to the carjacker whether that person has a badge or whether there's a law against taking people's cars. Discouraging nasty people from hurting others does not require special authority, only the ability to use defensive force. Ironically, though people hope that government will protect them, having a government, a gang which is believed to have the right to tax and control people, just creates one gang so big and powerful that normal people can't resist it. In short, to create a huge gang and then give it societal permission to control and extort people with the hope that this gang will prevent theft and thuggery is simply a self-contradictory idea, but that's what government always is. Some people might assume that if people organize for mutual protection and defense, then that's what government is. But there's an essential difference. People coming together to do something that everyone has the right to do, such as defend yourself, doesn't require any special authority. It's not government unless one group of people claims the right to do things which others do not have the right to do, such as taxing and controlling innocent people. Organized defense can be very effective without supposing the special right to rule over others, in other words, without being government. In contrast, governments rob the people they rule of far more wealth than private crooks could ever manage, making the idea of a protector government ridiculous. Another common objection to the idea of a stateless society is the notion that if not for a group of lawmakers telling the rest of us how to behave, we would all behave like stupid, irresponsible, violent animals. This claim implies one of two things. Either we normal people have no idea what is right and wrong unless and until politicians tell us, or the only reason we want to do the right thing and coexist peacefully is because politicians told us to. A quick examination of your own motivations will show you that neither of those things is actually true. It's particularly odd to make this argument in a society where politicians are voted into power. If the people themselves have no moral code and no conscience, and are just stupid, violent animals, why does almost everyone want government to keep the peace and protect the innocent? Would a population of vicious, heartless, evil people try to elect good people to keep the evil people in line? Obviously not. The goodness and the desire for order and peace comes from us, not from the lawmakers we vote into office. The same holds true of everything that government does. If people are so short-sighted and selfish that they can't be trusted to voluntarily organize and raise money for whatever they deem important, then how can those same people be trusted to decide who should be in power? The implication is that the average person can't be trusted to run his own life, but can be trusted to choose someone to run other people's lives. Government is really not a civilizing influence. It's actually an uncivilizing influence. People who would never personally rob their neighbors constantly use the government to do it for them by way of taxation. People who would never dream of trying to control minute details of their neighbors' lives think it's just fine to vote for politicians to do it instead. Government gives everyone the opportunity and encouragement to rob and control other people without risk. So government, rather than serving as a check against the imperfections of our nature, instead drastically amplifies our greed, irresponsibility, and malice towards other human beings 
by giving us a legally acceptable and risk-free way to interfere with the lives and choices of our fellow men and women. Government brings out the criminal and busybody in everyone. In contrast, in the absence of a ruling class, people would lose their ability to ask lawmakers to interfere with their neighbors' lives. And we would not have law enforcers who could avoid responsibility for evil deeds by claiming that they were just following orders. Throughout history, far more theft, assault, oppression, and even murder has been committed by those acting on behalf of a supposed authority than by anybody else. Even basically good people, when they believe in government, will condone things or do things which they know would be wrong if they did them on their own. Most people know that theft and assault are bad, but they imagine that controlling their neighbors and forcing them to spend their money on things they don't want is perfectly moral and legitimate when it's done by way of the political process. Wrong becomes right when it's called taxation, legislation, regulation, and war. Anarchists know better. They know that human society will never be perfect, but it would be a whole lot better if evil deeds were committed only by genuinely nasty sociopathic people rather than being committed wholesale by basically good people who think that violent aggression is okay when it's called law enforcement. The fundamental principle of voluntarism is very simple. It's wrong to initiate violence against any other person, regardless of badges, laws, or alleged authority. The only time the use of force is justified is to defend against aggression. Almost everyone understands this on a personal level, but they've been taught that this basic rule of social living does not apply in the game of politics and government. Most people already know how to get along with others, and most people want a peaceful and just society. Our morality doesn't come from politicians making laws. Our ability to organize and cooperate doesn't come from the ruling class. When people escape the belief in government, they don't suddenly turn into violent animals. Our inherent right to defend ourselves and our ability to defend ourselves is not served by government. In fact, it's threatened by government more than by anything else. Ruling classes do not produce peaceful coexistence, but rather perpetual conflict and violence. Our belief in government authority takes our compassion, virtue, and good intentions and turns them into power for people who crave power and riches. Of course the people who benefit most from the political racket will put a good spin on the system and do their best to convince people that it's a social necessity. But ask yourself this, have the thousands of laws, regulations, and taxes imposed on you by politicians made you a better person? Have they made you more productive or more caring? Is the world better off with the politicians taking your money and telling you how to live your life or do you think it might have been better off if you'd been allowed to spend your own money and make your own decisions? Is society really best served by a small class of people forcefully imposing a centralized master plan on everyone else? Can the orders and threats of a ruling class make the world what it should be? Or would society be better served by human freedom and respect for individual rights, by voluntary cooperation, and peaceful organization. If this second option sounds better to you, maybe you should learn more about anarchism. Some people dismiss anarchism as a utopian idea that would only work if everyone were generous and compassionate. Obviously, everyone is not generous and compassionate all the time. But these people need to look at the other side of the coin if people are too stupid, greedy, and malicious to be free, aren't they too stupid, greedy, and malicious to be trusted with power over others? Whether people are inherently good, bad, or some of each, giving a person power over others is not going to make that person better. 
In fact, power has historically been known to corrupt people and make them worse, whereas the discipline imposed by the equal freedom of everyone else brings out the best in human nature. Most people today think that we need some form of government because they mistakenly believe that obedience to authority makes us all more civilized, moral, and peaceful. In reality, it has always done exactly the opposite. Everyone knows that governments can be corrupt, abusive, inefficient, counterproductive, even tyrannical. But most people assume that the way to fix that is to get the right people into power. People have spent centuries trying to create a good society using different kinds of ruling classes, different legal structures, different ways of choosing the rulers, and so on. But every governmental construction has resulted in freedom and riches for some, and oppression, violence, and poverty for others. What if, instead of deciding what the throne should look like and who should sit on it, all people of goodwill embraced the non-aggression principle? What if, instead of looking to a ruling class to impose our values on society, we embraced the concept of self-ownership? These principles are simple and easy, to the point of being self-evident, but they're diametrically opposed to the authoritarian principles that most of us have been indoctrinated with. Anarchism does not mean chaos and violence, or every man for himself. Having no government does not mean having no morality, no organization, and no cooperation. Simply put, anarchism does mean that no one is your master and no one is your slave. And that's all it means. Howdy, Larkin Rose here. Uh, I'm feeling slightly less than entirely patient and polite today, so if this video gets slightly caustic, uh, too bad. This video is for all the people who are constantly saying, well, if not for government, we couldn't have roads, or we couldn't have police, or nobody would care for the poor, or we, couldn't, we wouldn't be protected, whether it's from, from local thugs or from, from foreign invaders. We wouldn't have this, we wouldn't have that. So thank goodness we have government and taxes, because we wouldn't have any of those things. And the first way I'd respond to that is by pointing out the assumptions that underlie that complaint, that, that, that argument. Basically what people are saying, because let's be clear about what the terms mean, government is the people who boss everybody else around. And taxes are those people demanding money from us. So they basically tell us, hand over a whole bunch of money and we'll decide how to take care of you. We'll decide how to spend your money. Uh, if we don't like it too bad, we don't really have a choice. Like, well, you can vote in a few years and maybe something will change, even though it totally won't. So that's what people are saying. Basically, if we didn't have a ruling class stealing our money and then supposedly spending it to protect us, how could we possibly have roads or anybody to protect us? The implication is that in this country, for example, 300 million people would just sit around thinking, oh, we just, we can't do it without politicians and tax collectors. We can't have a road, we can't protect each other, and we can't... And it, it rests on this bizarre assumption that things that almost everybody wants, they wouldn't do anything to make happen unless there were politicians forcing us to give them money so they can make it happen. And so an example I like to use is, let's apply the same argument to food, because food is pretty darn important, I think everybody can agree. Let's apply the same argument that, that statists use about the roads or caring for the poor or protection or anything like that. The argument would go like this. Now in the context of food, listen how idiotic this is. If we don't have government demanding money from all of us under the threat of caging us, and that's what taxation is, here's the money you have to give us, here's the nasty things we do to you if you don't. If that didn't happen so that they could build a big food production and distribution system and feed us, well, we'd all starve. We'd all just sit around saying, gosh, I wish we had food, but, you know, no politicians and tax collectors. Uh, we're just going to sit around and starve to death. 
Now, in this country, nobody would believe something that stupid because all you have to do is go to a supermarket and see a perfect example of really efficient, organized cooperation that nobody is forced to do. There is no, you know, if you're going to make the argument that people make about roads and, and, and protection and all that, you'd say, well, nobody is forced to make any food for anybody in this country. How do you know everyone's just going to say, well, it's not my job, and we'll all starve to death. There's no guarantee. There's no master plan guaranteeing that we'll all have food. So obviously we're all going to starve if we don't have an authoritarian government stealing our money and then making food and giving it to us. Because golly gee, we couldn't possibly do it voluntarily ourselves. Again, in this country, nobody makes that argument because they see it happening voluntarily. Nobody involved is, is forced to do that. Nobody is forced to make you a single bite of food. There is no guarantee at all from anybody. And yet, Americans are, by and large, hugely overweight. Obviously, we don't have a lack of food. We might have a lack of healthy food. But obviously, we see that example, oh, we can handle that. You know, voluntarily, mutual cooperation, that's fine for food, but for some reason, it's not okay, and we can't even fathom the idea of the exact same thing handling roads or handling protecting us or other things that almost everybody wants. So there's in the question is this bizarre assumption that everybody will sit around really, really, really wanting something, but because there aren't politicians bossing us around and stealing our money, well, how could we possibly do it? And one of the most common things is who will build the roads? which is amazingly stupid to me, just amazingly stupid. I have here in my pocket a little tiny thing. With this little tiny thing, I can be most places in this country and call people all over the world. And I own it myself. I'm not anywhere near rich these days, but I own one. Almost everybody I know has one of these, a little thing that can fit in your pocket, and just on a whim, you can open it and talk to somebody who's on the other side of the planet. And there was no coercion, nobody forced anybody to make one of these. This is the result of voluntary cooperation. And that's it. Free trade. Organization, yeah, good. Cooperation, yeah, good. Coercion, which is what government is, and taxation, which is theft, didn't need that to do this. So what these people are telling me, oh, we wouldn't have roads if we didn't have government, is that somehow free individuals, relatively free, interacting voluntarily can make it so I can talk to almost anybody in the world on a little thing that fits in my pocket on a budget that is not a very good budget at the moment, but I still have one of these. That freedom, not authoritarianism, can supply me with this, but freedom cannot achieve a flat place because that's what a road is it's a flat place from here to there because we have these machines that take us from here to there by the way we don't have those machines because of government we have those machines because of free enterprise and voluntary interaction and cooperation the idea that freedom can make a car but can't make a flat place is just idiotic you really think we can't make a flat place? And, and so I ask people, and they say, well, we'll build roads. Are you really telling me that you really and truly think that if government fell off the face of the earth, 300 million people in this country, 7 billion if you want to include the whole planet, would sit around in their houses thinking, golly, I wish I could go visit Fred, but eh, I can't because there's not a flat thing for me to him. And I don't know how to do it. And the other 300 million or 7 billion people, we can't possibly do it because there aren't any politicians and tax collectors. If they were here, we could do it. If they were here to boss us around and steal our money and really inefficiently build a flat place, then we'd be set. Then I'd be comfortable and I could be confident that I could get places. I could visit Fred. I could go shopping. But now we're all going to sit in our houses wishing we could go to the corner store, but we can't because, golly, how could we possibly make a flat place from here to there? We can make these, where you can talk to anybody in the world. We can make machines that you drive around in. But no, we couldn't possibly make a flat place. And when people say, well, who will build the roads? The first answer is the same damn people who do it now. Politicians and tax collectors don't build the friggin' roads. Have you ever seen one out there? No, you haven't. 
They steal our money, waste most of it, do all their corrupt games, and then they pay other people. Here's an idea. How about if we pay those other people who actually build the stinking road? And the fact that that doesn't occur to people is a great indication of how well indoctrinated people are by the rulers who will perpetually tell us you can't organize anything, you can't achieve anything, you can't do anything unless we are here to force it on you. And it's, again, there are a zillion examples, whether it's caring for the poor or protection or roads, obviously, where most of the population will say, I'm really concerned that poor people won't be taken care of, which means most of the population wants people in need to be taken care of. And if we didn't have politicians stealing our money, how would it happen? Here's an idea. Take some money out of your pocket and give it to one of the people that you think needs help. Why would you not comprehend that, but you would comprehend some guy a thousand miles away passing a law to send an armed thug to take your money, to waste 90% of it, and then give a little bit to somebody who may just be defrauding the system or may actually need it. And the amount of indoctrination required to make people even ask these questions of how could we possibly do this without government? What do you think government adds to the equation? It doesn't add any resources. It doesn't create anything. Everything it gives away, it steals from us first by way of taxation. It doesn't add any skills. It doesn't add any knowledge. The people who are here would still be here if the institution of government fell over. We have all the know-how, we have all the resources, all the technology. The only thing it adds is one group that's imagined to have the right to violently assault and control and extort everybody else. So what the question really means is, how can we have a road, or how could I help that poor, or how could that poor person be helped, or how would anybody protect us if there wasn't a gang of thugs with permission to violently control and rob us? And when you recognize that that is literally what the question means, you already see how utterly idiotic it is. And it's completely the result of authoritarian status indoctrination. Nobody would come up, on, come up with that on their own. And, and you obviously don't see that with the example of food or cars or cell phones or anything else. Nobody says, we won't be able to talk to each other unless there's a gang of thugs that's around, allowed to boss us around and steal our money. And just economically, how stupid do you have to be to think that's a good idea? Here are your choices. Let's do this. I'll give you these two choices for how you will be fed from now on. Either you can go spend your own money wherever you want. You can go to the supermarket or the local this or the local grocery, whatever you want. You can go decide what you want and they'll tell you the price. You decide what you're going to buy and how much. And, and you can go to different places and you can shop around and you can do all that. That's option number one. But let me warn you, option number one does not give any guarantee that you will be fed. There's no master plan forcing people to feed you. So, oh my gosh, you better be really scared of that option. Despite the fact that you can do it day after day and it works really darn well and feeds pretty much not only this country, but with a massive surplus. So that's option number one that apparently statists are scared of. Option number two is politicians will take as much money of yours as they decide to take. Then they will decide what, if anything, they will buy with that money in terms of food to give to you, to feed you. Do you really think that will serve you better, that that will feed you better? Yeah, I'm much more comfortable that I'll have a, a you know, I'll, I'll be fed, I'll be secure, everything will be okay if a gang of thugs, who doesn't really care about me, steals my money and then decides what, if anything, to give me back from what they stole. But that is implied in the question, whatever you put in the blank, you know, how are we going to have blank if not for government? What you're saying is, how can we, the people who really want roads and food and cell phones and protection and all the things that almost everybody wants, how can we possibly have that unless we give someone permission to steal our money and boss us around and then decide what they're going to give us? And the same thing applies no matter what you put in the, the blank. How will we possibly do blank without government? Um, one of the silly ones is, is caring for the poor. How will we care for the poor? Think of what that means. Like people, it, when more than half the country votes for a party to take care of the poor, it's more than half of the country saying, 
we're really concerned and we want to make sure that the less fortunate are taken care of, but we don't believe that normal people acting in freedom will take care of them. Well, if the people didn't care about the poor, they wouldn't win the election. By definition, if you vote for a welfare state, you're an idiot. Because either people are heartless bastards and you're going to lose, or people are compassionate and giving, and you don't need to win. Just give them your stinking money. But people play the game, and that's the Democratic Party lives off of the idiotic notion that you're all so heartless that you should vote for us to steal your money to give to the poor. And half the country falls for it. Yeah, we're all so heartless that we voted you into office for the specific purpose of taking our money to help the less fortunate. That's just freaking brilliant. How about if half the country just gave their stinking money to the less fortunate? And then the less fortunate would all be rich because it would be a trillion times more efficient than the government version of, of welfare ever is. Also, it would be actual charity instead of mass theft and corruption and fraud and all that fun stuff. But what takes the cake, the ultimately insane thing, you know, whatever you put in that gap, how can we have blank without a parasitic ruling class and a bunch of hired thieves? It's just a stupid question, but it's extra super stupid when what's in the blank is how will we be protected? Who will protect us from thieves and robbers if we don't have government? It's the most idiotic question. It's also the most frequent question from statists. So here's what the question literally means. If we don't give a certain gang of people permission to violently control us and take our money under threat of putting us in a cage, who will protect us from people who might commit aggression against us and take our money? Wanting government for that is exactly as brilliant as saying, we have to have a carjacker in our town, otherwise somebody might steal our cars. Government is an appointed thief. If you don't think taxation is theft, first of all, you're a really well-trained slave. Second of all, try not paying. See what happens. See if they say, oh, that's quite all right. Or if they say, no, you're going to pay or we're going to take your stuff or eventually we'll put you in a cage. And when people say, that's not theft because we get something back. Learn to think. And I use this example all the time and all I ever get is stupid looks from statists in response. If I robbed you at gunpoint, of a hundred bucks and the next day I gave you a sandwich and you said what I said hey now everything's fine because you benefited I gave you a, a service I, I gave you lunch so that retroactively makes it okay that I robbed you at gunpoint would you buy that argument no you'd say that doesn't make it okay okay you gave me a sandwich and yet every status makes the exact same argument when it comes to government well we get some stuff for it after they demand our money under threat of violence and putting us in a cage. Then we get services or goods. We don't get what we asked for and we get lots of things we didn't ask for, but we kind of get something and that retroactively makes it okay for them to say, give us this much of every paycheck you make or we're sending men with guns to take your property. And the slaves justify their own enslavement. I'm proud to pay my taxes. I'm proud to get robbed by a parasitic ruling class and get a little bit back and feel good about it. Like, not only is that legitimate and justified, but I feel proud that I let myself get robbed by a bunch of crooks and parasites. But again, the ultimate thing is protection. When people say, who will protect us from aggressors and thugs and thieves if we don't have a government? Even though what government is, by its very nature, is a gang of aggressors and thugs and thieves. They issue commands, every law they pass is a command backed by a threat of violence. You have to do this, you're not allowed to do that. Here are the nasty things we will do to you if you, are get, if you get caught disobeying. I mean, everybody knows that even though it's, they don't usually say it in terms that blunt and honest and accurate. But to say we need taxes to be protected is as stupid as you can get. It's saying we need theft to avoid theft. And the fact that people are trained to use different words so that this theft sounds okay. It's legalized. It's taxation. And we voted for the people who robbed us. Like, we got to elect our local carjacker. And that means he represents us when he demands our car and points a gun in our face. He's serving us as he steals our car because he's going to use that car 
and sell it and make money to make sure nobody else steals our car. That is the essence of government. And the fact that you have hundreds of millions of victims of that scam vehemently defending it and saying, I, I'm not going to give that up. I don't want to give up government. Who would protect us? I don't want to give up the biggest aggressor on the planet, the biggest thief on the planet. Look at your tax bill and see how much private crooks steal from you. So before you ask that question, before you ask, how could we possibly have roads or protection or water or air or Christmas or Santa Claus or any of the zillion things that statists imagine we can't possibly have without a ruling class, think about what the question actually means. Because when you get to the point where you understand the implications of your own question, asking how can we possibly have this without a parasitic gang of thugs robbing us, when you actually understand what you're really asking, you won't ask the question because you will realize it's completely freaking idiotic.